it's fashionable these days to see oppression in an intersectional way. According to this way of seeing things, some people are worse off than others by virtue of belonging to certain groups. Being Indigenous, for example, confers disadvantage on an individual such that they rise higher in the oppression league table above someone that's white. Feminists generally agree with this hierarchical, ranked way of seeing oppression. They see white, middle-class women living in the affluent world, therefore, as low down on the oppression league table, and so as hardly oppressed at all. They are even hostile to middle-class women for this perceived lack of oppression. Liberal feminist Anne Summers in 1975 published the best-selling book Damned Whores and God's Police in which she derides middle-class Australian women as God's police. She criticises them for, quote, internalising an image of themselves as asexual and puritanical mate creatures. And she describes in favourable contrast to these women women in the sex industry. These prostituted women are to be admired in comparison because all pretense of affection and romance is stripped away with the prostitute and the purely sexual nature of the transaction is laid bare. This means that she is in a better position than the married woman for she runs no risk of disenchantment. She is better protected from rape and other forms of sexual violence than the woman alone in the marital bedroom with her husband. She also has far more independence. She can reject a customer and can determine the extent of the sex activities with one whose custom she has accepted. This quintessential idea of the sexual revolution is that wives and mothers in affluent countries are contemptible for failing to exercise sexuality to their full advantage. The sexual revolution newly introduced the idea that sexuality was empowering a means to empowerment for women. So the perceived constraint in the way that wives and mothers exercise sexuality made them enemies of feminism. This view influenced a great deal of feminist writing in the 1970s and 1980s. Feminism became a movement that advocated for some deserving groups of women, usually ex women in the third world in conditions of extreme poverty, against the interests of some undeserving women and these women were usually seen as middle-class white women living in the affluent West. The feminist I introduced today is a heretic because she wrote a book in 1986 that precisely resisted this view. Oppositely, she showed how mothers and housewives in affluent countries are a patriarchal creation of equal importance and equal concern to, for feminists to that of super exploit, exploited women in the third world. Accordingly, she wrote, quote, there is a realistic base for international solidarity among women or for global sisterhood, end quote. While she did readily acknowledge that, quote, women of all classes in the West and middle class women in the third world are among those whose standard of living is based on the ongoing exploitation of poor women and men, she nonetheless argued uh, that against, she argued against turning any group of women into villains in respect of the workings of what she called capitalist patriarchy. Maria Mies published Patriarchy and Accumulation on a World Scale, International uh, Women in the International Division of Labour after spending five years in India. Her doctoral dissertation from this time was published as Indian Women and Patriarchy in 1980 and in a subsequent book two years later based on additional fieldwork in rural India called The Lace Makers of Nasapur. This was published in 1982. In other words, by the time she wrote Patriarchy and Accumulation, Maria Mies knew a great deal about the lives of women in the third world as in compared to uh, women of her native Germany. Indeed, she wrote the book after returning to Germany to take, to take up an academic position. It was upon returning to the affluent West that she came to realise, in her words, how 
the enslavement and exploitation of one set of women is the foundation of a qualitatively different type of enslavement of another set of women. One is the condition as well as the consequence of the other. Maria Mees continued working as an academic until her retirement in 1993, and today she writes about ecofeminism eco with collaborators like Vandana Shiva. Patriarchy and Accumulation was published in a second edition in 2014, which contains a new author preface. In this edition, Maria Mees shows how the historical sequestration of women in the Western world as, house, as housewives, mothers and sex objects kept away from the means of production was crucial to the development of capitalism. This historical process involved first, the bourgeoisie withdrawing their women from the public sphere and sh sh shutting them into their cozy homes from where they could not interfere in the warmongering, money-making and politicking of men. Then this same bourgeoisie created the ideology of romantic love as a compensation for and sublimation of the sexual and economic independence women had had before the rise of this class. This process of creating women as housewives, mothers and sex objects filtered down to all classes of women in the Western world. And this process occurred over the, the same historical period in which women in the third world were colonized and subjected to quote, a process of super exploitation. Mies emphasizes the fact that these two processes did not just happen side by side and are not simple historical parallels, but are intrinsically and causally linked within this capitalist patriarchal mode of production. The creation of savage and civilized women and the polarization between the two was and still is the organising structural principle of capitalism. This international div division of labour is recognised already by Marxists as splitting the world into consumers versus producers. But Maria Mies alerted feminists to the fact that it also, quote, divides women internationally and class-wise into producers and consumers. As a result, she writes, third world women are objectively linked to first world women through the commodities which the latter buy. This means that, quote, it is not enough that these commodities are produced as cheaply as possible. They also have to be sold. So Western women play a crucial role, not just as producers, but as consumers, as housewives, mothers and sex objects. This symbiotic relationship between women split into rich and poor is not static though, in Maria Mies's opinion, and she sees Western women's creation as sex objects as now delivering women in the third world escalating horrors of production. She wrote in 1986 that Asian women in the free production zones are not now seen primarily as workers, but as women. In contrast to the women in the house industries, they are this time primarily defined as sex symbols. This shows how closely this whole mobilization for Asian women for production for the world market is linked to the prostitution nexus. This nexus sees the development of sex tourism, reproductive exploitation and male order bride industries trading women in the third world. But in Mises' view, the emergence of this, these industries has been possible only because of the way that women were created in the affluent West. This creation is one of sub sex object and even today increasingly so. By the same token, women in the rich world are unprotected as a result of their 19th century historical defeat as housewives, mothers and sex objects, when they were purged from the category of worker and cut off from the means of production. As a result, they now find themselves bereft of any means of resisting practices of patriarchy 
that are forged against originally against women in the third world. Maria Mies cites the example of pornography in the 1980s in which the video industry thrives on violence against women, many of whom are women of colour. The taboos against torture and violence against women were first broken with regard to coloured women. Now white women are also increasingly given free for the satisfaction of the apparently irresistible appetite of white men for sexual cruelty. In the realm of production too, Western women increasingly fall victim to practices forged against women in the third world. Maria Mies writes that Whereas the consumer housewife in the West has to do more and more unpaid work in order to lower the cost of production for the realisation of capital, the producer housewife in the colonies has to do more and more unpaid work in order to lower the production costs. Both categories of women are increasingly subjected to not only a manipulative ideology of what makes a modern woman, that is a good woman, but even more to direct measures of coercion. Maria Mies implores feminists to, quote, overcome the limited view of cultural relativism, which claims that women are divided by culture worldwide, whereas in fact, we are both divided and connected by commodity relations. This call for recognition of women's common cause under capitalist patriarchy is very different from the advocacy of feminists of the 1970s and 80s, who promoted division among women on the basis of ideas that were born out of the sexual revolution. Nonetheless, Maria Mies in 1986 limited her account of women's common cause to relations of commodity production and consumption. Her view of a basis for female solidarity was constrained to the need to collectively resist the impos impositions of male capitalist economic interest. But women's common cause ar arises out of factors uh, more important even of that. Women collectively face impositions of male sexual interest. The co-founder of this feminist heretics lecture series, Kate Phelan, in September 2020, reminded us that men invent class also for their sexual purposes. Maria Mies overlooked this more fundamental problem in 1986, but now, more than 30 years later, the sexual degradation that threatens even the daughters of the upper class gives women an unprecedented opportunity uh, for global sisterhood that intersectionality both overlooks and obstructs. Feminists talk of higher class membership as something that advantages women, making them better off than their counterparts in the lower class. They, they fail to see what Kate does. First, that men have invented class for their sexual purposes. And second, that if they have, and if higher class membership is just another way that men make women degradable, then it hardly advantages women, certainly not as women.